There's the difference between success and significance. You want to see significance? Measure that success by the people you have raised. What if you began to measure success by what you have given, not by what you have? You know, there is a type of mentorship in the Bible we don't talk about. Do you know in the Bible, the fact that you were part of someone's growth does not mean you are their spiritual father. That Ananias got Saul, say, and laid hands on him, his eyes that were blind opened and never called him spiritual son once. Some people are so eager to contain you. If they give you advice once, even you will be surprised. Say, welcome my son. Ah! The way Africans understand leadership, when you choose your leader, you have chosen your embargo. Because it's as if the way they see it, it is their job to make sure you never exceed them. They will cut you to sizes. If you want to unlock a new dimension of leadership, of trust, of authority, teach people to do what you do. You know, ironically, you will think that if you teach people, then you are replaceable. But the irony is, when you teach people to do what you do, you step into a new dimension of leadership. You have more loyal people. Don't hoard knowledge. Don't hoard power. The record for the first man to walk on water lasted only a few minutes. The moment Peter saw Jesus walking on water, said, can I join you? Jesus said, come. What kind of leader is not bothered about people breaking his record? When you begin to read this, Jesus is doing that. It renews your mind about leadership because there are some things we've learned wrong. Share knowledge. Don't hold power. Share it. All right. I want to share something very simple. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5. I think this is a very important text. Every believer needs to know this. There is a brand of Christianity that focuses only on what Christ has done for us and does not emphasize the responsibility that that bestows on us. You know, I used to say jokingly seriously that a lot of Christians know John 3.16 but do not know 1 John 3.16 written by the same author Interestingly, and by Kairos, the same chapter and verse, but different books. And you know John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. First John 3.16 tells you that if Christ sacrificed His life for you, you also should sacrifice your life for the brethren. A lot of people just receive the life of Christ without receiving the responsibility that it bestows upon them. And I mean, listen, where in the world will someone give his life for you? And that won't come with responsibilities. And you've even lied in some of the songs and the worship songs that you listen to. I have nothing to give you. That's a lie. You have a lot to give. Start with your life. Give him your all. Come on, are you with me? The Bible says, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto he who died for them and rose again. I think the last time I was here... I shared from that text too. Listen, so in case you didn't read the terms and conditions, the same way we do when we're downloading apps and there are three pages of terms and conditions, we just scroll and say, I agree. May that behavior not put you in trouble. You know, but I want to let you know, you are implicated by the life of Christ. You see, uh, there are a lot of Christians who don't really know what we've entered. You don't know what this is. For instance... Maybe someone hurt you, um, especially a believer in Christ, and you don't want to forgive. What? You don't want to forgive? You don't have a choice. Don't you understand? It was part of the terms and the conditions. Forgive us as our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. So the moment you receive the free gift of the salvation package in Christ, that disqualified you from the right to ever hold a grudge. Are you listening to me? Now you must forgive. It's part of the contract. Now you must forgive. And now you must live your life for him. Because your life is his to live. I always like to give the practical example. Just imagine you were walking across the road. And unbeknownst to you, um, some hitman was trying to target you to kill you. And a good Samaritan saw it. Not only did he call your attention, he ran. You know those movies? Have you seen those? No! You know. And I'm like, is the bullet so slow? But never mind. You know? No! And then he jumps like... <laughs> and he takes the bullet for you. And he dies. Then you discover that this man who died in your stead has three children. Those children need to go to school. Those children need to eat. Then you are now there saying, I have nothing to give you. What? You have a lot to give. Those children are your children immediately. Don't you understand? You know that, don't you? They become your responsibility instantly. Because 
Were it not for that guy, you'll be dead. When you're looking at him in the grave, you should reckon that should have been you. Come on, are you getting this? And listen, this is the kind of mentality you should have as a believer. And so the reason why Philippians 2.5 is important is because it just highlights the kind of mentality you should have. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Oh my God, so much to say about this. Because in today's church, a lot of people do not realize that in Christ is not just a message to believe, but a mentality to emulate. In Christ is not just a message to believe, but a mentality to emulate. Oh yes, you believe and you are saved and you will never perish. Thank God. But after salvation, there is discipleship. Now there is a mentality. There is a way to think. There is a way to live. And you see, unintentionally, we have been more evangelical than we should have been raising disciples. Evangelism is important. But when you have brought people into the fold, they need to know the responsibilities that you have. Now you've been adopted into the family. The house is yours to maintain. What kind of mindset should I have? And before we talk about so many of these things, I want us to use Christ as an example. Since the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. And I want to say in passing that a lot of people are in church, but they don't think like Christ. They have not renewed their mind. You can be religious and very wicked. I'm sure you know that, don't you? (laughs) Religious and very wicked. And I don't want to give examples. But I want to give you four of the many reasons Jesus was by far the greatest leader this world has ever seen. Four of the many reasons. I know that the major purpose of the Bible is so that you can understand salvation. But just the way Jesus went about it, there's so many things you can learn. So many hacks on leadership. The way he chose his leaders. You know, I think the first person I heard talking about this was Miles Moreau. And some of the things he pointed out were very profound. Just the fact that he chose the disciples to begin with you must always choose your team. Are you aware? Even if you get into a new position, you must choose your team. And when you choose your team, you must segment that team. Amongst the multitude, you must have 12. And amongst the 12, you must have 5. And amongst the 5, you must have 3. And amongst that 3, you must have 1. You will be in trouble if you treat an acquaintance like, a, like, a, like your best friend. You will be in trouble. That's a hack right there. But that's not even where I'm going. First and foremost, Jesus empowered his disciples to be able to do what he did. Do you know not many leaders know that? Listen, especially if you are an African, which most of you are. You have to understand, there is something about us, this insecurity... Eh? left to us, there will be no succession. There will be no succession. We think it is only reflective in our politics. It's in every industry. Every industry. Every industry. I read somewhere, I don't know how true it is, you know, there's an African president, I think he's almost 90, he wants to, to contest again. Allegedly. I'll be out in a token. <laughs> you know, because you see, we, we don't know how to lead. We know how to rule. We See, we hold on to it until we die. <laughs> we treat it like marriage till death do us part. <laughs> but look at Jesus. Do you know what it means? 
to work closely with someone who could do so many great mighty works. He's healing the sick and doing all those things. And then one day, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, he calls all his disciples and gives them power over unclean spirits. You know, according to Luke 10's account, they came back rejoicing. You could tell that they were amazed. Even the demons were subject to us in your name. They, they felt they had, they had won a lottery. That they knew they didn't qualify for it. Someone gave us this. Someone gave us this. What a privilege. Please, are you listening to this? If you want to unlock a new dimension of leadership, of trust, of authority, teach people to do what you do. You know, ironically, you would think that if you teach people, then you are replaceable. But the irony is when you teach people to do what you do, you step into a new dimension of leadership, of trust. You have more loyal people. Just learn to do it. <laughs> Don't hoard knowledge. Don't hoard power. Just think about it. And I want to, I like to put it in this way so that you realize how interesting it is that the record for the first man to walk on water lasted only a few minutes the moment peter saw jesus walking on water he said can i join you jesus said come come if it is you how will you feel so now what for you you know wait let the record rest <laughs> What kind of leader is not bothered about people breaking his records? What kind of leader? And he's saying, come. And he's even encouraging him, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Come. What kind of leader is this? The very things that I'm doing, come and do it. Oh, no problem. See, now, when you begin to read this, Jesus is doing that. It renews your mind about leadership. Because there are some things we've learned wrong. Some things we've learned wrong. You know, <laughs> as an unspoken rule, hey, hey, the way this sermon is moving me, I don't want to say some things. But the way Africans understand leadership, when you choose your leader, you have chosen your embargo. Because it is, <laughs> it's as if the way they see it, it is their job to make sure you never exceed them. They will cut you to sizes. They will restrict you. That is the way they understand it. That you must be low. But we have not so learned. See, I don't know why the Lord is moving me to start this way. Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? Let me tell you one secret about Celebration Church. If you like, copy the way we do our services. Point out all the places we have branches. Try to imitate it. One of the greatest secrets of this church is that we try our best to lead like Jesus. No true leader holds on to the same followers forever. In fact, that term, followers, I will prove to you is wrong very soon. But just hold that thought. I don't know if you know that I did not send Pastor Bright here to start a church. I don't know if you know that. I did not. I don't know if you know that the pastor of our, our Dallas church, I didn't send him there to pastor. I did not. But the truth is, we have such a strong discipleship curricula that all of the leaders around the world, all of them, I mean, even more than we have ordained, can start churches. And part of the reasons why that is effective is what I am teaching you. Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? Share knowledge. Don't hoard power. Share it.
There's the difference between success and significance. You want to see significance? Measure that success by the people you have raised. Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? You see, someone who has one million and someone who has given one million, they're not the same. Oh? What if you began to see success? Measure success by what you have given, not by what you have. Jesus empowered people to do what he did. Number two, Jesus empowered people to have what he had. <laughs> to have what he had. I mean, think about the mentality. The writer of Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 12, he puts it this way. He says, but he that sanctifies and those that are sanctified are one. He says, he is not ashamed to call us brethren. Think about this. Think, oh my God. Listen, let me tell you something. I know that there are some people who are so selfless. They don't mind empowering the people that are under them. Maybe you empower your driver, empower your cleaner. It's, it's a different thing. But just imagine, uh, great, come here quickly. Just imagine you were preparing for a, very, for a big wedding. All right? And because of you, someone who was walking under you was going to come. And you give him your card. Go and buy yourself something nice, a, a nice cloth, because you're going out with me. Now, that's nice. Isn't that nice? But it's a different thing when both of you show up at the party and you're wearing exactly the same thing top to bottom. I'm not judging you. How many of you feel some of Wait, my hand is up. So that you... <laughs> So I'm explaining, listen, don't you understand? Just so you get what Christ did, he gave you his identity. He gave you his name. It is one thing that he could die for you. But listen, that you can stand in his stead, that Paul could say and not be lying, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. In Christ's stead? Ah! This is a new dimension. I can go in his name, function in his name, like, see, the disciples went in his name flexing. Coming back rejoicing. The demons were subject to us in your name. Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? I'll never forget, I think it was in 2011. I told the demon, come out! The demon said, huh, it's because of God. Oh. I said, yes, it's because of God. Come out! <laughs> Say, thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Come on, say it from your heart. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, he tells you, do the same. Think like that. Act like that. He did it for you. Listen, you have no excuse. You have no excuse. He has more dealt leadership to you. You're not just an African man. You are born again. Are you listening to me? Don't be an oppressor. Give people wings to fly. And when you discover the wings are colorful, don't cut it. Don't peg it. Allow them. Be happy for people. In private and in the open. Don't be the kind of boss that they can't share stories with. Are you listening to me? You know, something happened. I was serving somewhere in an organization. And the Lord led me to move people to to get something for one of my superiors. So I mobilized people and we bought something really nice. The moment we bought it, one other superior who understands the politics of that organization looked at me and laughed. He said, you don't know what you've done. He said, they will transfer him. Because you bought something nice for him, he will be transferred out. Oh, yes. And I thought he was bluffing. Two months after, he was transferred. You don't understand. Because there are some places where the leaders are allowed to be liked, but not too much. <laughs> if you don't, they pass like this. You know, you have to go. And like I said at the beginning, you can be born again and be doing this because your mind is not renewed.
John 15, 15. I call you no more servants but friends. Because a servant does not know what his master is doing. John 20, verse 17. Don't cling to me because I have not yet ascended to my father. Go and tell my brethren. <laughs> have you realized men of God hog tied to more than Jesus? How many men of God in any context ever under the, under the sun can call a church member brother? Go and tell my brethren, I ascend to my father and your father, to my God and your God. <laughs> that's your model of leadership. Help me preach this to the person by the side. Say, that's your model of leadership. Listen, I know, you see, listen, you can conceive the fact that a leader will give people capacity to do what they can do. Or the exposure to have what he has. But listen, to do greater, greater, do you know what it means? That Jesus said, they, they that believe in me, the works that I do, they shall do also. And greater, listen, the first two, I know you can conceive it, but this one, greater, greater, that Jesus will tell the disciples, he has just cursed the fig tree and they were wild. He said, you know what? That's more. If you say to this mountain, what kind of leader is this? That is telling you, listen, it's okay. You can do more than I'm doing. And that's okay. You can do more and you won't be in trouble. Are you listening to me? I spoke to a tree and everybody is wild by that. If you say to this mountain, be removed and be thou cast into the sea. And you don't doubt in your heart, you shall have what you say. That is your model of leadership. What kind of security is this? Are you getting what I'm saying? What kind? What kind? Greater works shall you do? What kind of leader does not want to be missed? When I go, listen, he said, it is better for you that I go. Haven't you read that before? for you if I don't go the comforter will not come I am telling you leadership secrets of Jesus pick from this book pick from this book renew your mind let me say something are you ready for this you know there is a type of mentorship in the Bible we don't talk about do you know in the Bible the fact that you were part of someone's growth does not mean you are their spiritual father that Ananias got Saul saved got him filled with the spirit and laid hands on him, his eyes that were blind opened and never called him spiritual son once. Wake up. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? There is another extreme. I know some people, they hate accountability so much. I'm not giving you bullets for your wicked gun. Do you understand? Do you understand? But, but I'm just like, some people are so eager to contain you. If they give you advice once, you, even you will be surprised. You say, welcome my son. Ah, where you born me? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my God. There are people, if you collect favors from, expect it to be shared in the evening news of the next day. Breaking news. Bukola received a 500 naira loan <laughs> from the great philanthropist. Hallelujah. One of the ways you know that you have found a good church is that you are pastored in such a way 
that you don't need the pastor for everything. Any church where the pastor is the only miracle worker is not a New Testament church. See, something happened just last month. Just last month. You know, one guy, his father was sick. The doctor had given him one verdict and he needed a miracle. So he brought his father, flew his father um, into Lagos to see me. And so the father wanted to go through the service and see me afterwards. During the service, one girl walked up to him and said, Daddy, the Lord said I should tell you this, 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 this. Spot on. Are you listening to me? Spot on. The Lord said, don't worry about your health, that he has healed you. The man said, what type of church is this? <laughs> He's waiting to see the man of God after service. And this girl walked up to him, gave him. You know, I can give you examples upon examples. There's a lady who had been um, booking an appointment to see me. I was just so busy. Just so busy. Because there were clear markers in her life that she was oppressed by a demon spirit. And she, she wanted me to cast the demon out. By the next time, my wife asked, oh, uh, so when are you seeing pastor? She said, oh, sister so-and-so prayed for me and cast the demon out. Yeah? None of the people I'm talking about are ordained. Are you listening to me? Uh, that's a New Testament church. Listen, we must choose our extremes if we be extreme at all. If we're going to be extreme, let it not be that we're arguing new tongues are for today. Let it be like the extreme of Corinth. Where Paul is saying, hey, wait, take tongues. God is not the author of confusion. Because everybody has a word, has a doctrine, has an... In- Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah. Everybody, they flow. I'm not listening to me. <laughs> everybody. Last month, my gym instructor, he said, sir, do you know why I joined your church? I said, tell me why. He said, when I came to your church, during the prayer, I saw in one corner, you asked people to hold hands. He said, the person by my side laid down on a sick person like this, and the person got healed. Hey! <laughs> he said, now my church be this. <laughs> Come on, say, that's my life. And if you just stray there, you are implicated, though. Just, just imagine the humor. You've been dodging your calling, then you join Celebration Church. <laughs> God has caught you. And there are some ministries, once you put your leg like this, to run, go hard, though. You know, there was one lady, she was determined not to follow God. But from the first day she came to the church, every night when she stopped coming, I would come to her in a dream, open Bible and start teaching her. <laughs> so she just can say, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> when God is done with you, you'll be amazed. Listen, you never listen. You, you when the angel salutes Mary, even Mary go fear. Do you have the right address? Me? Blessed and highly favored? Where me? I my God. And then she changed her mind later when she saw the plan of God. She said, now all generations will call me blessed. Can I give you a, a, a second to prophesy over your life? Say, all generations will call me blessed. Listen, see, if Mary at an adult, adult age still didn't have any inkling of a divine call. But it didn't mean she wasn't called. Unlike some of your friends that from eight. They started seeing visions. Have you heard people's story? You will feel oppressed too. Ah, if you hear the way God calls on people, you will think <laughs> you will think your calling is not strong. Me, how did I know it was time to start church? I just woke up in the morning and I knew. So when I started hearing people's story, 18-hour vision, I saw people battered, shattered, battered, tattered. Ah, ah. 
I say, God, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Come and call me again. Let's be sure. <laughs> Let's be... This same ministry. Do you know what 18 hours is? 18 vision for 18 hours. Ha! Ah. <laughs> and me, I just woke up. Something just dropped. I just felt, I felt like a piggy bank, like they dropped a the coin. I felt it drop. By the time I got here, I just knew. But I said, ah, no, no. Strong vision. You have not shown any signs of a divine call, but there's a call on your life. Are you listening to me? And God brought you here to prepare you. Listen to me. I sense very strongly. You're here because God wants to put a fire on you that will spread throughout Canada. Amen. Please say loud amen. amen. Because one of the biggest revivals this nation has ever seen is about to happen. And you are a part of it. Amen. When they are telling the stories, the story will not be complete without you. Amen. At least in heaven, it will be recognized you played your part. Amen. Come on, say loud amen. amen. Uh, not all of us will hold mics, not all of us will start churches, but listen, you will be a part of the move of God. Amen. Say amen like you believe. Amen. That being said, I have just two points that I want to tackle, two extremes in the modern day church. There are people, number one, who want to follow but do not want to lead. And number two, there are people who want to lead but do not want to follow. <laughs> the two extremes in the church. We're in a very interesting era of the church. And I want to start from the first, people who want to follow but do not want to lead. You see, you have to understand that the way church is being done, has morphed into something that is foreign, alien from God's plan. People do church with business model. <laughs> you know, I was in Lagos. The Lord spoke to me, just like Abraham. Leave this church and go to Abuja and start afresh. So I handed over the church, 250 members to someone. This was 2018. Went to Abuja to start afresh. And when the Abuja church started picking up, a pastor reached out to me. He said, um, can I see your documents, like your feasibility study? Feasibility study? So, at first, I didn't know where he was driving at. Because he asked me, so, what is the biggest church in Abuja? I said, I don't know. What is the... He was asking me some research questions. I said, I don't know. He said, can I see your feasibility study? I was so shocked. I'd never heard of such a thing in my life. So he said, so how did you come? I said, God said, come. <laughs> Problem deal. <laughs> Are you listening to me? And so when we use questionnaires, and listen, in some contexts, in some contexts, questionnaires are important, but not as a strategy for church growth. As long as you don't have the mentality, listen, and, and you have to protect yourself from that mentality. It has become so popular, you don't even know it is wrong. Because now, when you go to McDonald's and you go to a church, there's no difference. You are treated like a customer. And then the church will do anything to keep you. You know, someone did a post and said, um, Please, choirs, be doing songs that we know. Be doing songs, why would I come to church? You are singing songs that we don't know. Be doing... Meanwhile, your secular artists are dropping two albums per year, and you know them. You see, carnality has become so popular. You can't learn a gospel song. You can't sit, no seriousness. And this, the audacity for me, you, you think it's about you. That is only your song preference that we are to consider in CCI Global.
And now we have a lot of people, all they want to do is be served. And you don't know how wrong that is. Let me just quickly say something. Are you with me? Are you paying attention? You know, there's one common one. Ah, sister, Folu, why haven't you been in church for months? Yeah, because I was away for two weeks and nobody checked on me. Okay, that's wrong. I'm sorry nobody checked on you. That's wrong. Oh, sister Folu, have you ever checked on anybody in your life? Has anyone been absent from church that you noticed, you personally, and you called? Or you went to visit? It's a problem. You must think this is McDonald's. And everywhere you see God talk about the church, this, the sense of responsibility is clear. What he expects from you. You know what Jesus told the disciples? He says, go and preach the gospel to every creature. Everyone who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He says, and these signs shall follow. He didn't say these signs shall follow you who is baptizing, you who is preaching. He says, these signs shall follow them that believe. The new converts, in my name they shall heal the sick. Speak with new tongues. Cast out devils. He's letting you know, listen and never forget this. A pastor's responsibility is not to raise followers, it's to raise leaders. A pastor is a leader of leaders. You are not a follower, you are a leader. Never forget this. He gave some apostles and prophets and pastors, evangelists and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for ministry. You are here to train for ministry. A good church is a ministry training college. Such that if you go to a ministry training school afterwards, it should just be extra. But if you go to a ministry training school and everything you are learning is new, you are not attending a good church. Because the Bible is our only manual. We don't have a separate manual for pastors. The same manual that we used to preach the gospel to sinners is the same manual we used to disciple people and it's the same manual for pastors. It means that the curriculum in church should help you grow. Amen, somebody. Amen. The book of Timothy was written to a pastor and it's not a secret book. You have it in your hands. You have it in your hands. So this should be your mentality. Why is this important? Do you know the mentality that you are a leader, not a follower, changes everything. It changes your approach. For instance, the way you will listen to this message if you were a, if you were a follower is different from how you will listen if you were a leader. Imagine you knew that this evening you will preach to another congregation what you are hearing. Will your approach not be different? If you knew that when I'm done, you will go to another congregation and preach the same thing, will you not take notes? The reason why a lot of people are not as serious as they should be is because they think they are just mere followers. Meanwhile, the Bible says, perfecting the saints for ministry. It says the whole body fitly framed, to, um, framed together by what every joint supplies. Meaning, when God looks at the growth of a church, he's looking for your contribution. The average man may not be able to see that you're not contributing. Just like in those school projects, there will always be one person who will not do anything. Then when it's time to present, you will just come like as you are talking, you'll be adding bars. <laughs> you know that how frustrating and annoying that thing is. And they will score all of you the same way. Now, people are thanking God for the growth of celebration church. But you know, you don't have any contribution inside. If everyone prayed for the church the way you are praying, we'll be in trouble. We can't depend on your prayer life. If everyone gave the way you are giving, we'll be in serious trouble. <laughs> People gave sacrificially. We planted church. You attended. They reached your turn. And they say, these new generation churches, must I give? You must give in the name of Jesus. <laughs> no be here. <laughs> Don't try God. 
I won't try. Stop that rubbish. <laughs> and like I said, this is Celebration Church's secret. When, when it was time to ch- start the church in Port Harcourt, one of my, my, the people I had raised who was in Port Harcourt for work, are you ready to start? He said, yes. We sent him resources. That's how. Because the curriculum is strong. I'm using sight to tell some of you what God will do with your life. You can't dodge. <laughs> Amen, somebody. But there are those who want to lead but don't want to follow. That's another extreme. And I have a lot to say. You see, um, let me see. How many of you have been following 100 Days of Discipleship? With your full chest. <laughs> you know, I did a video for tomorrow and I think it's very important. For people who don't really have the heart for it, it might be slightly controversial. And this is what I think. I was talking about the pros and cons of the Protestant Reformation. Listen, when you're talking about church history, I know we only remember the Protestant Reformation in good light. And that is because it is fundamentally good. Listen, I'm I'm grateful to God for it. It happened by divine intervention, but there were weaknesses to that movement. I tell you for a fact. I tell you for a fact. Yes, quite all right. A lot of things were going on wrong in that time. If you committed a sin and you confessed to the Father, the, the, see, you, can, you could buy forgiveness. It was called indulgences. And one of the uh, historians, you know, what he was recorded saying is, part of the receipts they will give you had this statement. We restore you to the innocence you once had at your baptism. You know, that's after pain. You are restored to innocence. And so when Martin Luther was reading his Bible and saw the just shall live by faith, it hit him like thunder. You mean that righteousness does not come by pain indulgences or by night vigils or by prayer, just by faith? And that is what informed the, the, the Latin expression, you might have heard it somewhere, sola fide, only by faith. And then he studied some more. And then when he was full of conviction and couldn't take it again. He wrote the famous 95 Thesis and nailed it on the door. That's where war started. But you see, there is something about human behavior. We allow things spiral. We don't know where to cocktail things. And listen, so, of course, after that reformation, there were micro-reformations. The breaking did not stop. So after the Lutherians... We now had the Calvinists. And after the Calvinists, we had the Baptists and the Anabaptists. And, the, you know, now we, we have about 6,000 denominations. 6,000. 6,000. And don't you understand the extremes of it? That anybody can just wake up in the morning and shake, 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 shake. Say, I heard from God. I'm starting a ministry. No accountability required. Is that not what is happening today? See, at the time, there was one central structure. I know that central structure had its issues. I wish, and it's easier said than done, I wish we could correct the doctrinal extremes but still keep the structure. Because historically, the Reformation, listen, it led and influenced many wars. Many civil wars. So much to say about that, but it has a conversation for another day. And now, everybody is an authority. Thank God for the Reformation. Now, everybody has a Bible. By the way, the notion that this is a Catholic church that was hoarding knowledge, they didn't want us to have Bibles, is not true. Don't forget, at that time, there was no printing press. So it so happened by Kairos that at the advent of the Reformation, the printing press had just been invented. 
So more Bibles were printed. So it looked like part of the Reformation ideology that informed the printing of Bibles. Do you understand? But it, it wasn't part of it. What actually happened? Before the printing press, just imagine all the Bibles had to be handwritten. So it was scarce, it was expensive, it had to be preserved. Imagine you had a Bible written on animal skin. And one village had that Bible. Will you be passing it around? You go go lock down somewhere now. That's what happened. Come on, I get what I'm saying. So now, everybody had a Bible. They didn't have to wait for the Catholic Church for order and for everything. Just start your own. There is one of the denominations I won't mention the name. Do you know how it started? The King Henry VIII, he wanted to divorce his wife. The Catholic Church said no. So what he did was, he said, I'm not a Catholic again. He formed his own denomination. They married the new wife. Freedom. Abby? Now, if you go to a new city, you cannot just enter any church and be sure of what you will hear. I heard of a lady, she went into a church. And everything seemed normal until somewhere... Halfway in the service, they brought an animal, put on an altar, and started slaughtering. And carried the blood and wanted to start sprinkling. Things they happen. You will enter church, you are head of one church. Only the pastor speaks in tongues, and his, his tongue is, mm, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, before you know it, you just say, oh no. Where am I? <laughs> they will start passing red cloths. Yeah. This one with size you take. <laughs> because no structure. Go to the campuses and see what is happening. You will see 16 year old papa. The thing where papa they do, you'll be amazed. <laughs> they are washing his clothes. They are cooking for him. He's so irresponsible. No respect, no accountability. Some of you know what I'm saying. I went to a minister's training, minister's conference with ministers from around the world. It was break time. I went to the break. By the time I came back, one young boy was sitting on my seat. I said, uh, sorry, you're on my seat. He said, too bad. So, well, in his defense, he didn't know who I was, but did he have to? So someone at the back said, too bad, if, if you don't stand up now. <laughs> you know. But when I asked, they said, ah, it's one papa in one. Jesus. <laughs> look at me, say, too bad. Because we are all men of God. There's a problem. There's a problem. And now, no accountability. You just receive, everybody can receive revelation. Register church. Start teaching nonsense. Nonsense. Someone sent me a link just this morning. A man of God stood on the altar. Said, if Jesus is the only way, um, what about Abraham? As in, how did Abraham believe? What did Abraham do before Jesus? That means Jesus is not the only way. That Abraham had his way through Judaism. Elementary soteriology. You know, go learn. You know, do you understand? Because you were not properly pastored. See, our teens church, call randomly someone from our teens church, they will answer that question. It's very simple. The people in the Old Testament were saved by believing in Christ and what he will do. Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He was saved by believing in Christ and what he will do. We are saved by believing in Christ and what he has done. Christ has always been the way, the only way. Elementary soteriology. And because ignorance is so rampant, a blogger posted it. And now that rubbish has spread. There's trouble. And unfortunately, because we have too many people on the pulpit who were not qualified, they don't know doctrine, it has reduced the faith of the masses in the pastorate altogether. 
And now everybody is an authority. Everybody just they give takes. Twitter everywhere. Social media. A pastor will talk one, you will talk five. Quite all. Listen. So all I'm saying is this. Are pastors infallible? No. But I can tell you one thing for sure. This move that has led to a lot of people who are leaders but are not following anyone themselves is very dangerous. It will affect your worship. It will affect your accountability. I've been counseling people, including this morning. This lady, pastor's wife, said the pastor pinned her to the wall and was pressing her neck. If the devil succeeds in taking away accountability from the church, there will be a problem. Hear me well, there will be a problem. Church is still God's idea. You see, I heard a very powerful analogy that never left me. Most animals, they camouflage with their environment. But the zebra is different. The zebra camouflages with the herd. Are you listening to me? The zebra's camouflage is amongst other zebras. That is his safety. Not with the herd. And this was the experiment. So they wanted to study zebras and they kept painting. So when they wanted to study, you use a particular zebra in an entire herd for experiment. They would paint the zebra for identification. But they discovered every time they did that, it didn't take long. That particular zebra would die. Why? They now discovered it was because the lions found it easier to focus that you don't put red. See, it's that one with red that we are going to go for. Because the zebra's security is that it looks like every other zebra. Are you listening to me? That there is something about accountability in the church. The Bible says one will chase a thousand and two shall do what? It 10,000 to flight. We are better together. It is God's idea. And he prayed that we'll be one. Say loud amen. amen. There is no space in the word of God for individual Christianity. No space. Pastors need pastors. Pastors need pastors. You know, I think I've said it a few times. My counselors, they don't call me Apostle. <laughs> when I sit in front of Emmanuel, no, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You need it. It's still God's plan. Don't forget, if you are a follower, if you've been following, recognize that God has brought you to lead. And if you are a leader, Make sure that you are still accountable. That is the word of the Lord for today. And I'm going to round off with this. The Bible says, Joel's prophecy. You know what he said? He said, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh, says the Lord. He says, sons and daughters shall prophesy. Old men shall dream dreams. Young men shall see visions. He says, upon servants and handmaidens. Listen, He's not trying to give strict markers for the flow of spiritual gifts. You know, some people say eh, dreaming is for old men. That's not what he was trying to do. Listen to me. He said, I will pour out my spirit upon how many? All flesh. So he's given the categories to describe all flesh. By old men and young, he's telling you demography will not be a hindrance. Are you getting what I'm saying? He says, servants and handmaidens. It means God is not going to check your bank account because if, before he fills you with his spirit. There will be no restrictions. Sons and daughters, no gender restrictions. Are you listening to me? All this is telling you is, you have a part to play in the end time move of God. And he's going to fill you with his spirit. Say loud, amen. amen. Starting from your Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the utmost parts of the world. You know, I was, I was studying something. How many people in the Old Testament all together, and I, I don't know if, if this is wrong or not. But you see, the concept of the Spirit upon somebody was so strange in the Old Testament. 
It was for the elites. You had to either be a king or a prophet or a priest to have the spirit upon. And by the time you count how many people had the spirit upon, how many prophets in the Old Testament, how many kings in the Old Testament, and all those things, I don't think you can count up to 120. This is headed somewhere. And it was so sacred that when Joshua saw some people prophesying that were not in the camp, he went to report. It was like those, <laughs> those extra class captains. Did you ever have class captains? I'll never forget one guy. God has forgiven him. But I said, sorry, I want to use the restroom. He wrote my name. Ah. Bro, you wicked like this. He said, they say no talking. Ah. <laughs> Joshua went to report. And Moses said, I would to God that all of God's people were prophets. Well, so understand how significant it was in the, on the, in that upper room day. I mean, the day of Pentecost, 120 people were in the upper room and all of them were filled with the Spirit. You have to understand the fascination of the Jews. Why they will come together to wonder what is happening. Listen, in many generations, there was only one person with the Spirit upon. One whole generation. That it was possible in those days, in the Old Testament, you will never see someone full of the Spirit in your entire lifetime. Are you getting what I'm saying? Then 120 people at once, together, prophesying. Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? And then when they were wondering, Peter said, this is what Joel prophesied. Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? These days are different. These days are different. And we will do church the New Testament way. It is not only the pastor who will have the Spirit. He said, all flesh. That scripture is fulfilled in your day. Yeah. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? You are full of the spirit. You will start giving people spot on prophetic words. He said, young men shall see visions. Come on, are you with me? It's a new day for the church. A new day for you. Just speak in tongues. Speak in tongues for a bit. 